Good morning, everybody. How you doing? You looking good? <laughs> right on. Hey, um, 2015's coming to an end, huh? I don't think we're meeting f Christmas Day. And then the next Friday is a f the 1st of January, which is also closed. This is our last get-together of the year. I miss you already. Holy smokes, huh? But hey, happy 2015. Really enjoyed uh, the year and working with you. I hope you've uh, made some strides and found a, a, some success and a little bit of confidence. Maybe I was just a little bit a part of that, which would be really cool. But anyways, uh, my name is Wayne McDonald. I'm the Chief FX Market Strategist for Traders Way and an ECN that gives you direct access to the interbanking system, but also access to trading energies and metals and indices. And we're actually upgrading the binary platform, but we give you what you need. And our strategy was pretty simple. Um, I help you to develop skills and confidence. And when you're ready to trade real money, you'll choose Trader's Way as your prime broker. You'll, you'll trade successfully and profitably for many years to come. And your trading business will grow and grow and grow. And you'll provide for your, your family. And your mom will be proud. Thank you to FX Street for hosting again. Pretty cool. Been working with FX Street for well over 10 years. It's pretty cool. So what was the greatest challenge of uh, 2015 as a currency trader for you? Any, any obstacles that you overcame? Any brick walls you finally cracked through? Any success stories to, say, to talk about? <laughs> Not by Euro. <laughs> cool. Yeah, S&B started 2015 off with a, with a big bang, huh? In a very poor way. So how about this? Um, Bank of Japan tried to make some changes, and they, they kind of did what the ECB did, and uh, they fell well short of what the market was, you know, not expecting, but sort of hoping. So Japan um, came out and, um, yeah, used a pop gun, not a bazooka. So the end moved for a little while and then gained strength again. I wonder why these central bankers don't understand that, you know, we're ready for them to do drastic things and get serious, and yet they don't get serious. We're ready. Come on. Sorry, I'm eating a granola bar. Apologize for that. All right. So, anyways, yen strong. But look at all the um, the analysis we've done in the past, whether it was a, a day ago or a week ago. It doesn't really matter. But look how the pound yen in this case behaved. Do you see the uh, top line resistance? Yeah, we drew that. Oh, I don't know, last week or uh, early. This, I think it was last week we drew that. And then if you look at the spike on today's news, whoa, way up here, straight down like a ton of bricks. Let me ask you, were there orders sitting right here in this gray zone that I drew last week? Yipper. Wayne, have you fixed your system? Can you get emails? I, I don't know what you're talking about, Mendicus. More input, Stephanie. All right, so anyways, that's pretty cool, huh, though? Nothing's really changed. The world is going in the direction it really should. We're ending the ending the year right there. <laughs> right? We're kind of like right where it should end, right? Isn't that interesting? So that that's uh, the yen is disappointingly strong, which is not good for global macroeconomics. Um, Japan's not going to love that. But, you know, really nothing dramatically has happened versus U.S. dollar. Uh, and the British pound is, is is losing some, and that's not good. So I'd like, you know, it'd be great if I could fast forward and see six months from now and find out if the pound yen goes up. <laughs> Don't you wish you had a time machine like that? I'll tell you, Joseph, but it'll cost you a cigar. All right. So um, let's just go start around the world. I don't remember that, Mindigus. Who uses Yahoo? 
Maybe that's why. Really? <laughs> Yahoo! <laughs> really? <laughs> I used to know a guy at Yahoo. Yeah, he made like, uh, I don't know, $40 million. He's no longer at Yahoo. That's the problem with the Silicon Valley. Smart people start great companies. Then they make more money you could possibly spend in five lifetimes. They leave. And then idiots show up and they're like, man, Yahoo makes people millionaires. I want to work at Yahoo. And they drive the company into the ground. <laughs> I've only seen that like a thousand times. Huh? I want to work for Google so I can be a millionaire. Um, it's just that attitude right off the bat that's bad for those companies. But, um, but anyways, I want to show you oil. Oil. Way down here. Isn't that interesting? Uh, trading at the end of the trend. But it's also the attitude. You don't build great companies because you want to get filthy, stinking rich. You build great companies because you want to change the future and you're willing to work hard for it. Then the future changes and the consequence of your brilliance and your tenacity and your vision, well, income flows your way because you deserve it. That's usually what should work, right? So anyways, um, so we're here at oil, and wow, huh? Bottom, bottom. And this is the, uh, this is the cash market. The futures market got down to, what, 34.50 the last time I looked, 34.40? You, you met your broker, the smiling right on, dude. So, yeah, very interesting stuff for oil, right? And... Do we have any news on the calendar today? What currency trade? Uh, what currency should we be focused on on this beautiful Friday? CAD. See, I'm I'm, I'm scratching my chin. Hmm. Awesome. Yeah. So we got some CAD and oil's tanking. So. You would. Would you uh, would you like to trade some CAD? Yeah. Why not? Huh? All right. A couple of things I want to point out right off the bot. Let me... Uh, what is the upside target for the week? If you were a bull in this pair, which of course we were, what it was the target for the week? This, the bottom of this red zone. So let me back out here. And, you know, this actually goes back quite a ways, right? But nonetheless, if you're a bull, this is the conservative target right here. And the upper part of this zone is the aggressive target. Now, obviously, because we started the week so high, we started the week way up here at M3, this could easily, according to pivot point theory, hit this uh, R2, right? So the theory really is that we should be able to get here. Okay, that's one thing. Hit me, baby, one more time. So are there other pivot points? Are there psychological levels? There's lots of other things that could um, be impacted up near that level. And guess what? 1.4000000 is right in that zone. How cool. Isn't that neat? Okay. So one of the things I've been reviewing the last couple of weeks on this pair is this idea of up, back to the moving averages, which is a buy. Up, back to the moving averages, which is a buy. Up, back to the moving averages, which is a buy. And you continue doing that until it stops, right? How do I teach you how to tra trade? You keep buying forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. This will never, ever, ever stop until it reverses. <laughs> but that's the attitude, right? It'll never, ever, ever. That's a song, right? Never, ever, ever. Um, it'll never, ever, ever, ever uh, stop. 
So how about on a four hour? Mendigus, you're way and check your mail. You have got empty one from Mendoz. Still don't know what you're talking about, dude. But I guess if you're sending me, me email and I'm not getting them, that's it. What email address are you sending them to? So anyways, there's the, uh, there is the four hour. Now, if I asked you to draw the MACD, could you do it? Anybody? Bueller? Well, the first thing that you would want to do, let's do it. Uh, okay, if MACD was up here, right? Oops. The first thing that you're, want, you're going to want to do is look at a water line. That's the zero line, let's say. Okay. And are we above or below the zero line on MACD? Above. In fact, it crossed above right here ish. So it kind of braided in here, and then MACD's been rising, 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 rising. Okay, cool. It actually has dipped a couple of times. If you really want to kind of get into it, it dipped, a, so it did up and then kind of a down and then up and then kind of a down and then is easily moving up again. Okay, so you should be able to just eyeballing, there's an expansion, right? Divergence and then a little bit of convergence and then divergence again and then a little bit of convergence, and then divergence again. So this is slowly and steadily going up a little turn, up, 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 a little turn, up, 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 and it's just climbing, climbing, climbing. Isn't that cool? And of course, I could, I could put down a MACD and prove that that's right, but you probably know I'm right. So then what's the point, right? So here's the thought. If, you, if we're going to have slow trading, in fact, we're not going to be able to get together for the rest of this year just because there's no more trading on Fridays. Um, it'd be interesting if you studied an indicator. Find an indicator that you actually like to use and spend five to six or seven or eight hours over the course of the next couple of weeks researching the mathematics behind the indicator and study it. Become an expert in something by the end of the year. You say, I don't know much, but I know MACD. Right? Isn't that how you begin your, your future as an expert in the foreign exchange market? You find something to excel at. You find something to be an expert at. So here's the interesting thing. If you're in my seat 10 or 12 years from now, if each year you mastered one thing, in 10 or 12 years, you'll be a master at 10 or 12 things, which is probably enough, right? It doesn't matter to me, Bernardo. Really, I, I couldn't care less which indicator. It doesn't matter to me, as long as you know how to use it. See, most people use too many indicators or the wrong indicators at the wrong time, or they use the right indicator at the right, indi at the right time, but in the wrong way. Um, I, I know traders that just mix indicators together or they use two different indicators that say the same thing. And I'm like, I don't get it. Why do you do it that with that and that mixed with that? Which one are you looking at? Cause they're all the same thing, just in different math. Oh, well, it just helps me see it. All right, fine. I can't argue that. If it helps you see the move, it helps you see the move, but you really should know the math and the science behind it so that you can. Because what I, what I did early on is I manipulated the indicators to tell me what I wanted them to tell me so that I could understand what was happening in the market. Versus most retail traders, they just throw down a bunch of indicators and then just try to figure it out. All right, well, how do I combine the ADX with the CCI with the Stokes and the MACD? And how does that work with a bunch of moving averages and pivot points and Fibonacci and Elliott Wave and uh, Gartley patterns? You're like, you got all this there and your head explodes. And there's a big mess on your desk, right? Where your money used to be. But now there's just this big bloody mess all over your desk. Don't, don't let that be you, right? So 
there's a couple of things like what what does a central banker do? A central banker looks at past data, so they have a whole team of PhDs, right? And they analyze what's happening in their economy. Inflation levels at the producer level, inflation levels at the retail consumer level, output from factories, imports, exports, right? All the stuff. But that's all backward looking data, which is fine, right? But it's backward looking data. And then, but they also go out and they, they talk to business leaders and they say, how's your business doing? How are things now? How do you feel about the future? What are your customers saying? How do they feel? What, what do you think orders are going to be like over the next year? So on and so forth. Are you planning on hiring people? Are you plan are you, are you raising wages? All these very interesting things which are forward looking. And so you can use your indicators, just make sure they, they, you know what they, they're telling you. And then, you know, later on, you can start adding other layers of finesse to your trading, like planning ahead and thinking forward. Right? So anyways, I don't know how we got into that. But very, very predictable here. Very, very easy price action. And yet another day of profitability in, in a very controlled sort of fashion, right? Pretty elevated up here weekly pivot wise, but you could always change your pivots to monthly. Never, ever, ever. Okay. And there lies the problem. That's why I had weekly. What's the problem? I ran out of pivots. Yeah, it's been that good. Isn't that interesting? Well, you know, actually, most of this stuff, if you sit here long enough, James, it's not that complicated. And I think most people that have spent that much time in front of their charts start asking the same types of questions. So, you know, if... Gerald Appel hadn't invented MACD, I might have invented something pretty close to MACD. Right? Um, you know, I've never been taught Elliott Wave, but the little bit that I read, I find that I do that anyways. I mean, no one ever taught me Elliott Wave. I've never really read much about Elliott Wave. I haven't really seriously studied it. But the little bit I have read, I'm like, oh, I already do that, which makes me think in, in much of the ways... I would have done something very similar to Elliott Wave. I mean, I do it. I just, I kind of do a lot of wave stuff just because I observe the market and have noticed the same sort of patterns and processes that market participants use. And, you know, everyone says Elliott Wave is a genius. I don't think I'm a genius, but I would have figured it out just the same. And I think it's just, I don't think any traders are really geniuses. They just do what they're supposed to do when they're supposed to do it, and it all works out. So, you know, that's why I say just use anything you want to use and, and just understand what the math is and then so you can tweak it. So like the way I, I used moving averages. So that's what MACD really is, is looking at different moving averages. So like one of the weird things I see all the time is a trader will have two moving averages he likes to use and then throws down MACD that measures different moving averages. And I'm like, well, what are you doing? Well, I don't know. That's that's the standard default MACD settings. I'm like, so you really trade based on the 1226? No. Well, what the hell are you using your MACD like that for? Uh, I don't know. I told I was told MACD was important. Right? And then you're like, oi, vey, seriously? So that's why, like, I use a 2155 moving averages, and I know I use that in my mind to represent the the direction and the and the speed of the market. So the market right now is bullish and aggressive. Cool. I know that because I use a technical, a, a, an indicator rate. I'm using two moving averages to represent the speed and the direction of the market. So that's what it means to me. You know it. I've been teaching it here at FX Street for over 10 years. Okay, cool. And then the, the question is, 
in these little periods where they start to come together, sometimes they're very minute. Like you don't quite see them. And you could, wouldn't it be nice to have an indicator that says, all right, the market is still bullish because the 21 is still above the 55, but it's losing some steam. It's losing some participants. Maybe some of the bulls are taking profit. Like, wouldn't it be great to have an indicator that could tell you when these two moving averages are diverging from each other, meaning the market's getting stronger, or they're converging toward each other, which means the upward market is losing some steam. And then what you do is, well, you create an indicator that just measures the distance between the two moving averages. And you're like, oh, my God, I just invented MACD, the moving average convergence divergence indicator. So now I'm like, I know exactly what MACD does. So I'm going to tweak it. Obviously, I'm going to use the 2155 and not the 1226. Because I actually want to know when these two things are getting slightly closer and then when they're expanding, when they're converging or diverging. It's important to me, but I'm still bull all the way through it. So that's why very often you'll see a, an amateur trader says, you know, oh, I'm, I'm shorting this pair. I'm like, why are you shorting this pair? It's bullish. Oh, well, my MACD's falling. Yeah, but it's well above the waterline. You're not even using it right. What's wrong with you, boy? Oh, well, he uh, crossed it. fell down. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> You're like, well, yeah. Why don't you study it, bro? Get into it, right? Master it is all I'm saying. <laughs> Don't you use the moving average five and the eight? Oh, yeah, I use that too. What does that tell me, though? That's just price action. That doesn't tell me anything about the market. So how about this? If I think the market is bullish, the market, right? Hey, what... What's uh, what's the USD CAD doing today? Whatever your answer is, that's the market. The general direction of the 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 thing, or the direction. Though it's not quite trend, but what's the market doing today? Okay. And if the answer is bullish, that's cool. Okay, it, it's going up. But even in a bullish market, throughout the day, price is going to fall as well as rise. But because it's bullish, it's probably going to rise more than it falls. But there's definitely times throughout the day, even though the market is bullish, price is down. Agreed? Okay. So shouldn't I identify those moments? And if I'm profitable, wouldn't that be a moment where risk is increasing? And maybe I should take some profit? or move a stop, or just at least acknowledge it, right? Instead of hoping, you're just like, oh, wow, price is coming down and I'm bullish, so I probably should do something, right? But then what about the other side of that? The market's bullish, but suddenly price is resuming its upward move. Wouldn't that be a good time to buy, like when price is starting an upward move in a bullish market? That could possibly be an ideal time to buy back in, right? Right, Bernardo? And if that's the case, I need to identify those situations. So I have two things that I can use. One, the 5A cross. Is that the most important part of this chart? No. No. What's important is the market is already bullish. Market. That's why I'm looking at this. The general upward move, the market, is up. Okay, good. So I'm a bull. That's it. I can do that analysis in, in one shake of a lamb's tail. Boom. So now the next question, what's price doing? Is price moving up? Or is it moving down? Well, I want to I want to buy in when price moves up. Boom, Sh right? Boom, shalaka laka. Well, I also have this thing here. You notice this? Whoop whoop whoop. That's my Stokes measuring price's ability 
over the last few candles to make either higher highs or lower lows, which is another way of saying if the Stokes is up here, it's overbought, and if it's down here, it's oversold. Okay? And these crossovers up or down are important. Okay? So in here, should I be buying? Hey, the market's bullish. Right? The market's bullish. Why can't I buy up there? I got nothing but green candles. Why can't I buy up there? It's overbought. Just on price, though. But the market's still going up. You could still be a buffoon and make, make some money there, I suppose. You're just going to have to sit here for four days and not make money. But we know you're not going to do that, right? You're going to freak out. So it's overbought. And it's coming down. Boop, 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 boop. It's overbought because in here, traders, actually right in here, okay, right in here, traders started to take profit. And Stokes knew that before anybody else. And it starts coming down, starts coming down. It's still bullish, but is it an ideal time to buy? No, 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 no. So when is it an ideal time to buy? Stickety Stokes tells you right here, just after the kick off the 21. 5A cross up, Stokes cycle back in the direction of the prevailing trend in a bullish market. Yeah, buy it oversold at, at support when price resumes its upward move in a bullish market. Not complicated, right? Hey, Imram. Hey, we've been, we've been doing these webinars for 10 years, dude. Welcome. This is your first day. <laughs> Where have you been, bro? Welcome. Yeah, welcome. So anyways, guys, when you put it together, it doesn't sound that complicated, right? I mean, doesn't it sound like common sense? Is the market up or down? Up. Well, you should buy retracements at support. No, it does sound complicated. Or it, what? Talk to me, Goose. No, Gino, because it wouldn't be what we're looking for are extreme conditions. And we're also looking for trend, right? So you see this one? Pretty lame, right? But how about this? The most important thing is price action. Are we in here? Are we trending? But so many amateur traders throw down trades and market conditions like that. Oh, but the Stokes cross, Wayne, the Stokes cross. I'm like, really? The Stokes makes it decisions for you? But you told me, Wayne, you told me to. No, I didn't. <laughs> is the market trending? Right? Is the market bullish or bearish in here? It's not doing anything, right? All right. But what about up in here? When the moving averages are diverging in an upward slope. Yeah, okay. It's moving up. So, right. So now it gets interesting, right? So you say, aha, gegzus. Now, the next question you should ask me is like, Wayne, how did you know it was going to do that? Well, I can say, well, fundamentals, well, we've been trading oil, well, well, well. But the honest answer is you, you don't really know, do you? Right? I mean, you you got longer-term trends going on, but let's let's just say, you know, whatever. But my advice to you is you don't try to outsmart the market. You don't say, well, I'm going to do this, or well, I'm going to do that, because I know it's going to do this, or I know it's going to do that. No, you don't. Okay? So my advice to you is let it break out, and then, if, then, if it breaks out to the upside, then buy, uh, buy the retracement back at the moving average. That's a mean reversion. Okay? Okay? Now you got yourself a trend, a higher, high, higher, low scenario. Okay? Then, because you have a breakout, 
that should be the beginning of a trend, which means a new, newer high, a new higher low, a new higher high, a new higher low. And that's trend trading now, right? And you just do that. But you're not doing that in here. So you wait. But the other point I want to make here is the support and resistance trumps everything. Your stochastics is completely worthless. Completely worthless without support and resistance. Okay? So, really, do I really care about Stokes? No, I care about support. Do I really care about Stokes? No, I care about support. Do I really care about Stokes? No, I care about support. Do I use Bernardo? That's like, do you breathe air, Bernardo? Oh, by the way, Bernardo, I think you're posting to just me. You should post to everybody. So here, here's my opinion. You need to learn price action. That's where you start. If you don't understand that, you just not, nothing's going to help you. If you don't understand how price moves in the market, you just everything else is just a waste of time. You need to learn price action first. And then, you know, once you identify price action and basic things like trends or versus consolidation, then you can start picking tools that help you identify what you're doing, right? So things like, um, do I use Fibonacci? Well, of course, right? I mean, it's just, yeah, of course. You have, I mean, you basically have to, okay? Um, I have a, I have an, you know, my opinion with, with pivot points is you just have to use them and you say, well, why? And then it doesn't take me long to, to prove to you that professional traders use them. I, I mean, I just know I, all the time you just see the, the unbelievable irrefutable evidence that markets reverse at things like monthly pivots and, we, and weekly pivot clusters and and amateur traders are not using them. They're like, well, I just bought one more time and then for some reason I lost on that trade. Well, yeah, well, you, you it was a bad trade, right? Well, I don't use pivot points. So, you know, but do you have to have to? You know, no, you probably, you really should master a pivot point. You don't really need them, but if you mastered one thing, it would have to be price action because at least if you didn't have a pivot point but the market started to reverse or consolidate, at least the price action would tell you. It might not give you a change in trend, but it'd give you like uh, 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 at, at least a pattern like uh, a higher high, higher, higher low, lower high, higher low, and you're like, whoa, whoa, we're not making higher highs or lower lows? The U.S. debt 1050, right? Yeah, so like after the big news we had, what, last week? The market freaked out. Do you guys remember that on Euro USD? I did this here at FX Street. And it's, and, you know, someone shorted at 10 and, and made money. And I said, well, 10 isn't really the number. It's 1050. And that ended up being the actual high of the entire market. It took another day and a half to get up there. But it was the 1050, and I, I nailed that within, I think it might have gone two pips beyond that. And that ended up being the top, and then it dropped, and then we went into the Fed meeting, then it dropped some more. But it was just simply a pivot point. Not any sort of, like, genius. It's just, like, you should know that. Oh, well, the line is really 1050, not 10. Okay, Richard asks, uh, you, where do you place your FIB? Well, it's, it's peaks and valleys. And then, you know, other than that, it comes down to, it's very subjective, whatever you're measuring. And usually, if you are using different time frames, you're going to look at different moves, but peak to valley, right? So it's a retracement tool. So do you use, do you use uh, Fibonacci in here? No. Why not? Fibonacci is a trend trading tool. That's why. Pretty simple, right? So when you get this breakout, so let's measure that, okay? 
you want to say to yourself, well, this is bullish. I'd like to buy it, but I need a discount. And that's basically how you use your, your pivots, right? And you could say, well, my ideal zone is somewhere between the 382 and 618. Did this work out just tickety-boo that way? No. It doesn't matter. Now, price action, guys, price action says this. This is your first AO. Not the not the 382. Okay. Same thing, like this is your area of opportunity here. Didn't quite get all the way down. Got pretty close. Okay. Here's your new AO. Here's your new AO. So they're not always there, depending on these expansions and stuff. But they're guides. So, anyways, it makes a new higher high. Measure it any way you want. Peak to valley. Okay. This one 382 very nicely. Okay. 382 predicts 1618, which is here. Just happens to be our current. Okay. So now it's made a new higher high. So you got to measure this peak to that valley, for example. Okay. Could you measure this one? Yeah, if that's what you want to do. Could you change this time frame and measure the whole move? I mean, it's all subjective. It comes down to your analysis, right? You're just at, at, you're asking yourself if you're measuring this move, you know, wh where's the buy zone off of that? Okay, but very subjective. You probably have to double click it and run. Uh, Jimmy uh, James says you don't know it's going to go sideways before it does. Though, well, there is usually a lot of clues. There's usually a lot of clues. But, you know, it's not, you know, written in stone, but there's usually a lot of clues in the price action, um, news related. So what's on the calendar in two days very often can create consolidation uh, because people just don't want to add new money if there's important news in a couple of days, right? And so on and so forth. Um, you know, I don't know. There's, you know, you're right, but there very often there's clues. Uh, let's put it this way. Uh, you know, I, I'm not a perfect trader by any means. I, I certainly can't predict the future. But Forex, if you spend enough time and effort to really learn it, it's not surprising very often. It's when you start flipping both ways, trading both ways like a broken gate, you're a buyer, seller, seller, buyer, buy it today, sell it tomorrow. You know, sell Euro dollar, sell Kiwi dollar, but trade the Euro Kiwi. I'm like, what the heck are you doing? Oh, well, I see you set up on this. I'm like, you're just throwing trades down blindly, dude. Um, over the course of years, you start to, your trading starts to mature and you start making a lot of dis decisions on like market sentiment, um, um, macroeconomics, central banking policies, um, um, cycles with, you know, let's say natural cycles like, you know, harvests and winters and, you know, all these different things. And, you know, um, like the third week of February, I'm going to buy Japanese yen. I just, I already know this. It's like a foregone conclusion. I'm already waiting for the Bank of England to raise interest rates in September. But the thing is, the things leading to that haven't even happened yet. But I'm already ready. I'm just waiting. That's why I kind of like shake my head at pound yen. I'm like, yeah, I know it's still falling. I know it's still bearish. I just, I just hope and wonder if it will finally gain the strength that I'm looking for. But it wouldn't be surprising to me. Because I've already thought about it, I've already anticipated, I've already done my research, now I'm waiting for the evidence of, of, of that to be truth, like scientific methodology. Is the assumption true? Are, are, is the data changing that would lead to that positive outcome? And if so, when do I start tiptoeing into that? And so after a while, there's usually not a lot of shock. So for example, like, when you get that 500 pip skyrocketing euro dollar. But we know that started from Draghi wimping out on his thing 
and then the market way too heavily long on U.S. dollar, but also very much too heavily short euro. And we could see by through the commitment of traders report that 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 market was getting bigger and bigger and bigger, way, 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 way too much dumb money in the trade. And that all it needed was an opportunity for the smart money to take profit, go, you know, and well, it did. And then we knew that none of the real big positions actually got out. Nothing really changed that much. No one actually bought euro. It was just all bears getting out. So then we can have a future anticipation since no one was actually bullish and a lot of bears made a lot of money that once, you know, once they were, you know, wiped out all the dumb money that we can get back into the direction of the prevailing trend based on the idea that the Fed's going to raise interest rates. And are they all going to pile in all instantly? No, of course not. But then we can start watching those trades re-enter, which they did at 110.50, not 110 the psycholo psychological level, but 110.50 the reversal pivot area which was also, I believe, a fib on the long run. So then it's just the same money that took the profit is slowly tiptoeing back in. But of course, they have year-end calendar taxation issues, right? They have their normal flows. They have annual reports to deal with. So when you look at it more like an institutional investor, it's none of it's really surprising. But if you're not doing your research, then you sit down every day looking for a trade, and you're like, man, this Forex thing is like, crazy unpredictable well yeah only if you have no plans now what's if you want to reverse that if you study hard enough and you and you work at it enough over the course of time you'll be shocked at how predictable things become right so that's what i want you to move toward and this is what I want you to tell yourself, especially if 2015 wasn't a good year for you trading and you're kind of questioning and you're thinking about it like, what am I going to do in 2016? Maybe I should get into that options course, right? Well, before you go to that level, I want you to hear a message from me that if you put the work in over time, you will, you will be shocked at how predictable the markets can be. And that if I can say that, there's a lot of hope for you if you put in, you know, the blood, sweat, and tears for years. And that I know you will say, wow, that's crazy predictable. It's amazing how that reversed at a pivot point. That's amazing, you know, how it does such and such a thing. And you'll just be shocked. Then you'll say, wow, if I only knew that three years ago, right? So there is a lot of hope, guys. Okay? And I hope you appreciate that I don't say, well, you need my magic indicator. So if you join my live trading room for only $300 a month and then buy this indicator and then take my training course, I will teach you how to become filthy, stinking rich. It'll be so easy. And then I have my mastermind course. That's only, you know, $7,000 a year. And then, you know, I'm just sitting here sharing. Okay? Yeah. And I've tried to give a message that if it's predictable, it's learnable. You understand? If it's predictable, it's learnable. This CAD yen or this USD CAD, and we're about 10 minutes away from the news, has been extremely predictable. Extremely predictable. It's been a very, very, very good currency pair to be trading for a very long time. And one of the things, uh, obviously, influencing it is oil. And it's just a... a, a a straightforward correlation. Let's move this to like an hourly chart. Right? So you saw USD CAD going up, which means the CAD's weakening versus the US dollar. But didn't it look a lot like this? <laughs> right? But just the opposite? Yeah. Yeah. What do you mean by WMD, though? <laughs> the 
weapons of mass delusion. Um, so anyways, cool stuff. And then I believe, yes, I have this paired up with the um, CAD Yen. Look at the CAD Yen today, guys. Isn't that great? This is the Yen news. And at first it moved up because like, oh, the Bank of Japan's going to make a serious change. And then they're like, nope. So the Bank of Japan's going to change the maturity of the bonds that they're going to buy? Whoop, whoop. Well, they're shifting their purchases across the yield curve. Wow. That's great. Good job, Bank of Japan. That changes everything. <laughs> Why don't they just say a hundred billion trillion gajillion yen? Boom. I still, I still, I still have nightmares for Japan. The, you know, when they're like, we're going to change the president. We're, we're going to put in a president of Japan or a prime minister of Japan that will will stop at nothing to create inflation. Then we'll replace the person at the Bank of Japan. Get get that person on board for creating inflation. So now you got the prime minister and the president of the Bank of Japan, and then we'll replace the Japanese Congress, and we'll put, replace the Japanese Senate. So you got the upper house, the lower house, the prime minister, and the central bank. They're going to do everything they possibly can do to create inflation. And then they're going to raise taxes and screw the whole thing up. I, it's like this reoccurring nightmare, like, oh, my gosh, you can't be serious. <laughs> Did you just do that? It's a nightmare. I wake up all sweaty like, oh my gosh, that's so scary. That's so scary. Show me what indicators? Sure. So that that's actually what happened to Japan. And, uh, you know, as far as I can see, they're going to be moving sideways for uh, the next 10 years, maybe another 20 years. It's really unfortunate because they came out guns a-blazing. I've never seen a country get so unbelievably serious about making a change and then and then still screw it up just uh, it's so disappointing i honestly thought that big move by japan was w worthy of history books and worthy of movies or something like um the amazing recovery of japan I mean, we'll never see the United States be able to pull that off, right? We'll never be able to see uh, the United States. Can you imagine the president of the United States gets elected because they want to do something amazing? And then all of Congress and all of the Senate is replaced under the same theme to do whatever it takes to do this amazing thing, sort of like... We'll put a man on the moon by the end of the decade, right? Um, and so, and then they get the central bank and everyone is totally on board and the whole government and the whole of society is focused on one thing, making the amazing thing happen, making the unthinkable real. That's cool, right? Japan did that. And still screwed it up. It's just amazing. So uh, too bad for Japan. Um, you know, one thing that I used to hear a lot about is, you know, is is the United States going to be the next Japan? Or are we just going to have negative growth for 20 years? And we've proven that America will do whatever it takes. And that's one of the brilliant things about America is that as soon as it realizes it's screwed up, it'll it'll take the bitter medicine as soon as possible make the fix and just move on and really almost forget the past and just move on to the next new thing. Like, uh, right? <laughs> Timmy. Um, for, I'll give you an example. Um, I was uh, in New York right after 9-11. Um, I think the year after 9-11, so I don't know. But, um, and 
no, wait, it was way after 9-11. What am I talking about? But anyways, they, they, it was still a hole in the ground. They still had fences up, and it was very a solemn place. And I was in New York to speak at a Forex conference, and I got a whole bunch of people together, um, traders that used to hang out with me every day and some uh, business associates and stuff. And I took everyone on limo rides through New York City, and, and uh, we pulled up to Carnegie Deli, and, and you know, 50 people had lunch. And uh, the, that funny story is I go in there and I go to pay and they're like, we don't take credit cards. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. There's, I just bought lunch for 50 people. They're like, yeah, no, we don't take care credit cards. Too many, uh, too many tourists rip us off. I'm like, you see outside that the door, that's my white limousine. <laughs> So she said, oh, come with me. And they had a secret credit card machine at, at Carnegie Deli. I'm like, that's my limousine, baby. You Take my American Express, will you? Uh, so anyway, so um, after lunch, we go all the way downtown. I want to show people Wall Street because a lot for a lot of people, it was their first time in New York. And then uh, we get down to 9-11, to the site of 9-11 and the, the, the trade, World Trade Center. That It's just a big hole in the ground. And it's very solemn, and everyone's having their moment. And then I see the the limo driver; he's just hanging out, and I, I and, you know, just classic New Yorker, right? And I say, you know, I say something to him, and he's like, "Yeah, let me tell you about New York, huh?" Right? He's like, Be "Beautiful old building, lots of history, and you appreciate it, but then you tear it down and you build something new, and it, that's just how New York is. You, it just." You tear it down and you build something better in its place. And then you it, that's it. And so, you know, they just build and pick themselves up. And I just thought it was really cool. And America just does that. It's like, all right, we went through a period of five years of just horrific situations, but we did unbelievable, crazy, ridiculous things to ensure we get out of there fast. So, but you know who's going to be in the 20 year um, sluggish uh, market like Japan's been in? Who do you think? Who's going to be moving sideways for 20 years? Europe. Europe. Europe doesn't have a financial problem. The ECB is actually done a very, very good job. Like, remember the, the European politics negotiated with Greece for, I don't know, what was it, five years and got no, nowhere? And then the ECB finally steps in after the ninth referendum. The ECB steps in and just withdraws all the cash out of all the banks. Greeks go to the ATM on Saturday. Whoop, 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 there's no money in the ATM. Crisis solved. <laughs> Monday morning, that that got taken care of. Um, it's not a monetary policy issue anymore at all. ECB's done everything it possibly can. It could do more numbers-wise, but it'll help. It'll stimulate. It'll move some money around. But Europe's 20-year problem or 200-year problem, we don't know, comes down to the, the, the politics, the, right? the cultural, social politics. And uh, I don't think there's a quick fix on the horizon for that, right? Oh, I'm sorry. Did I miss the news? Yeah. So let's go into the kitty cat. So uh, Europe has to get pretty serious on that one, guys. So big shocker, right? Big shocker, uh, USD CAD went up again for the 500th time. Got to get through that big psych. We're still quite a ways from the psych level, so we can... Oh, crap, crap. <laughs> what did I just do? <laughs> I went to do this. So, oh, I thought, well, I guess it moved pretty quick there then. I thought we had a little more room there, but all right, coming up to the big number that, you know, 20, if you know me, I, I play the 80, 20. So this might not breach 140. It's a pretty big psych level, but it could also go up to 140, 20 and then have our hesitation. Then it would come all the way back to 39, 80. So look at the number here. We're right on, 
right? Boom, immediate drop. So, yeah, was anyone expecting like some ripper awesome inflation out of Canada? Canada's choking on oil right now. Yeah. So let's talk about important things here. Because look, if you're not on the CAD from four or five days ago, I'm not sure if you understand macroeconomics anyways, you're missing it. Um, but, you know, if you want to try to scalp it, you fib it. Watch the 80 level. Like I said, the 80 20s can be interesting. But let, let's talk about important things now. <clears throat> What's happening in the moment is almost irrelevant. Um, important. Uh, Bank of England on the 14th of January. Interest rate decision. Okay. Swiss National Bank is going to have its policy statement. Uh, oh, wait, that's March. Sorry. Um, I'm trying to put this in order and I have it all mixed up. Uh, Bank of Canada, January 20th. So maybe an interest rate cut. The 21st of January, ECB. This is the one where we, well, just like last time, rinse and repeat, we really, really, really want Draghi not to increase the duration, which he did last time. Like, we're going to do three more months of quantitative easing. You're like, wow, are you, you're blowing me away, dude. Or like Japan, like, we're not going to buy two years. We're going to buy five-year bonds. You're like, really? Because that, like, means nothing, right? All right, so we need a real report out of the ECB, like, bazooka time. We're going to double the amount of monthly quantitative easing. Let's just, boom, let's just get there. That's what we want to see. Um, but that doesn't seem to be happening. Maybe we're just too close to parity for them to want to do that and feel comfortable. But whatever, January 21st, okay? January 27th, Federal Reserve. Whoop, whoop. Okay? It's basically Jan uh, February, right? January 27th. So we got the 14th, the 20th, the 21st, and the 27th. All central banking announcements. Okay? And then just after that, just into February, February 2nd, Australia. Is that going to be our... our Australia might be our hero in 2016. Maybe. At least I'm thinking that we might be at the bottom or near the bottom. I don't know. It's uh, It's been an interesting, hopeful currency. And it'd be I don't think they're going to make a change there, but I think they're going to come out a lot more hawkish than they have been. But I'm already thinking February, guys. Right? The 27th was the Bank of New Zealand. They're probably going to cut interest rates. Lots and 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 lots of fabulous information. You need to be thinking about this now. Over the holidays, um, you should almost visit every single central bank website, read their last policy statement, and you'll usually find some like videos and some reports on various things that they, they've released that doesn't get covered in the newspapers, but are incredibly informed. So like if you were going to do anything in the next two weeks, if trading opportunities become less available or less catchable just because of lack of volume or volatility or whatever it is, you should go to the Bank of England website. You should go to the Bank of Canada website. You should go to the Reserve Bank of New Zealand website. You should go to the Bank of Japan website. You should go to the ECB website. You should go to the federal, various Federal Reserve websites. You should go to the Reserve Bank of Australia's website and just say, this is, I'm going to start 2016 kicking some ass. Pardon my French. I got my, right, my ass kicking boots on January 1st. I'm ready to go. Hot to go, H-O-T-T-O-G-O. -T -T -O -O. And just start off like right. And like I said earlier, pick one indicator that you like to use and you prefer to use, and then learn how to master it. Like understand it um, at a whole different level. 
Try to study the mathematics. Try to really, really. Um, how to really, really, really understand what's going on, okay? And just really start off confident. Start, like, even change your mindset a little bit. You know what I mean? Like, just start off completely different. Because a lot of what we do is confidence level, isn't it? Right, you understand? A lot of what we do comes down to confidence. Because you can learn your technical analysis, but I, I, oh, even when you kind of get good at that, there's a lot of challenges to confidence, right? So Imran says, but you've lost a lot of confidence in 2015. So you got to change things. And that's why I'm saying do something completely different. And just, you know, feel like you're making a change in your behavior and it's going to lead to positive things, right? Like tell your friends when they come over, like, you know, or like they invite you over to the house, like, come over for some brewskis, dude. Like, I'll come over in an hour or so, but right now I'm reading reports on the Bank of New Zealand's website about their monetary policy. They have a meeting coming up January 27th, and I think they might cut interest rates, and I don't want to be ready for that. And you're actually telling your friends or your loved ones, and it feels impressive. You, you feel like you're a pro. You, you feel like you're doing the right things, not just sitting down and looking for a trade on your charts. And, and you start to see that your behavior is leading somewhere not you're not always just intellectually some in many ways in many helpful ways it's an emotional change because you you're doing the things that should be done if you were professional if you were a confident trader where does your confidence come from right in the art of war the general who plans wins because many plans were made. So what are you doing over the holidays? Just sitting around watching TV, eating food, getting all fat and happy? Or are you mixing in some like hardcore research? Right? Are you ready for the Bank of England interest rate decision on January 14th? Well, I, Wayne, I, I, I didn't even know there was a meeting that day. Well, maybe you should. Right? Act as if. Act as if you're already successful act as if you're already confident do the things that earn you the confidence right and in my book i say one day you'll forget that you're faking it you know you're not a successful trader you know you're not a profitable trader you know you're not a professional trader but so what fake it act as if you were and in five or six years you might actually say oh, oh wow i completely forgot i was faking it and i've just been going to the I, I do things like research central banking policy and macroeconomics at the, all, uh, all the various different central banking websites. So, like, two things are going to happen, guys, and then I guess we'll, we'll end with that, right? Two things are going to happen. Every time you go to each one of those websites, you're going to learn a lot about the economies in those uh, countries. You're going to learn a lot about New Zealand. You're going to learn a lot about Australia. You're going to learn a lot about the European Union, right? You're going to learn a lot about the UK. You're going to learn about, you know, and you go through all these different things, right? You're going to learn a lot about them because obviously they're discussing the monetary policy for those economies. So you're going to hear Canada talk a lot about commodities. Cool. So there's going to be a lot of things there. And if they talk about things you don't understand, write them down. Maybe I can explain them, or maybe you can use Google, right? Hey, Google, what's the difference between CPI and PCE? And now you know. But the other interesting thing is if you're reading these reports and these you know uh, meeting minutes and the, the discussions that these – uh, members of, of the monetary policy committees are discussing, they talk about global economic data, like what's happening in the United States, what what's happening at the Fed, what's happening in China. They're, they're talking about these other countries, and you're going to learn other people's point of view based on other people's research about what's happening around the world. And this is what we do as foreign exchange experts. Change your behavior, 
and maybe it'll lead to a, a positive outcome, you know? And I'll be here for you throughout 2016. So if you have questions along the way, like, Wayne, what is the difference between CPI and PCE? I'm a qualified expert. We can talk about that. Wayne, what, what does it mean, you know, uh, what are they talking about balance of trade and, and capital accounts for, versus current accounts? And, but what, Wayne, what, uh, I'm here, man. I'm here for you. I've only been at Epic Street now for, what, 12, 11 or 12 years? I, I, you know, longer than there's been webinars. I guess it's been about 11 years. You know, I've only donated like 4,000 hours of my time to FX Street. Isn't that cool? So you have a, a great 2016. I'll, sm I'll smoke a cigar in your honor and, and uh, ponder your future success. Yeah. And if you find success, maybe from stuff that I shared with you, whether it's inspirational or actually truly technical or fundamental, I hope you tell the world. Okay? And, by the way, if you do become a success, you please tell me. Um, let's just say uh, finding money in this world is easy. Finding patient, disciplined traders that can conservatively trade money and consistently bring in profit um, is is more of a rare commodity than cash. So you, you tell me. Maybe we can share the, some success together, huh? Yeah. Yeah, just the, the hard work is worth it, guys. So stick with it. Like I said, I'll be here to help be a guide, share my experience. Thank you to the moderator. Happy holidays, moderator. Happy New Year. Yeah, we really need to thank our moderator. It, you know, they work hard, the moderators at Epic Street, and it's been another year. So really thank you very much for everything that you do, moderator. Bravo, 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 bravissimo, bravo, 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 bravissimo, bravo, bravissimo. <laughs> and remember, when you trade, never have fun. This is too serious to be silly. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and I forgot to mention, I'm accepting cigars. <laughs> if you want to send me a cigar... I'm accepting them. <laughs> Twelve minutes? Is it the? Uh, is it the big one? The ultimate event? The, the, yep. Yeah, this it starts. In, yeah. Twelve minutes, huh? Very good. I guess I better bow out for the big dogs. All right. Peace on earth. May the pips be with you. May our profits be above average. Cheers. See you next year. <laughs>